Good morning, Hillcrest Baptist Church, um, and welcome to anybody who is uh, tuning in as well. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, and spend some time in uh, the Word of God today. Uh, we're going to be in John chapter 13 as we continue uh, our study through this gospel. So let's read together John 13, um, verse 31 to 38. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, Where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterwards. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, Will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Uh, let's pray before we dive into this passage together. Dear God, um, we know that you are a loving Father, that you are full of grace towards your children, and for this we are grateful. And so we just pray for that grace this morning. We ask that you would open up our eyes, that we would see the glory of Jesus in this passage, the glory of your love for us. And uh, we pray, Father, that you would challenge us through um, the words of Jesus. Be with us in a special way, we ask, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was uh, younger, I used to love watching M. Night Shyamalan movies, uh, thrillers. Uh, M. Night Shyamalan is a director who is known for his you know, trademark mind-blowing twists in his movies. And I, I think we, we've all heard of you know, the iconic M. Night Shyamalan movie, The Sixth Sense. Now, I've spoiled two movies in the last two sermons that I've preached, so I, I thought I was just going to carry right on. Uh, but I think there's something in a preacher's handbook somewhere about um, spoiling an M. Night Shyamalan twist. Um, so you're going to have to watch that one for yourself. Uh, but when you watch a, a Shyamalan, uh, the twist will come and it's usually something that's completely mind-blowing and unexpected. Um, and it demands a rewatch. So, so you'll watch the movie a second time. And it's always a completely different experience watching a Shyamalan movie the second time because you have new information in your mind and you see everything, all the scenes are, uh, take on a, a different light. Well, something like this Shyamalan twist happened for the Apostle John on this night, the night before Jesus was crucified. It's the last supper that he's having with his disciples and, and Jesus really drops a bomb. Uh, in their midst, he, he says to them, one of you will betray me. One of you will betray me. And so we considered Judas last week. But we know that only John of all the disciples knew this night that Judas would be the one to betray Jesus. Jesus, he asks Jesus and Jesus tells him, it is the one to whom I give this morsel of bread after dipping it. Then Jesus dips the bread and gives it to Judas, and he says to Judas, What you're about to do, go and do quickly. And so even after Judas gets up and leaves, the other disciples still do not um, suspect that it's him. They think he's just going to buy food for the meal the next day, or that he's just going to give money to the poor. But John receives this, this blow, this shock, that I, I don't think we can really overestimate. A close friend, somebody he's walked with for three years as they follow Jesus together, is revealed to be a traitor. And all of a sudden, the penny would drop for John, like a Shyamalan twist. 
It would hit him like a ton of bricks. Judas is not going to give money to the poor. Does Jesus, does Judas even care about the poor? Oh my goodness, he's had the money bag for three years. No wonder he got so upset when Mary broke that expensive jar of perfume on top of Jesus. And we all joined in with the betrayer in attacking her, in attacking Mary's act of love. No, this, this is not a night that John would ever forget. And yet, as we saw last week, it's a night that he would remember forever, not just because of the bad reasons. He would recall fondly how even in the middle of the anguish that Jesus is experiencing at the, the truth, at the fact um, that Judas will now go and betray him, even with the looming darkness of the cross on the horizon, Jesus gives John this experience of, of closeness with him and a love that he can never and will never forget. I believe it's a love that will see him through the weeks to come. And will stick with him for the rest of his life. But I believe further than that, that this night, the words of Jesus and the actions of Jesus um, have shaped or will shape John's entire life. And not just his life, but his ministry in particular. The kind of apostle he becomes, I believe, stems from what Jesus is doing now. Remember, this is John, the son of thunder, with a, a temper to boot, who will become, as he's called, the, the apostle of love, tender and compassionate, living out a, a lifelong devotion to the Savior that is marked by a care for Jesus' flock. Now, why do I say that this night will have this kind of an impact on John's ministry? Firstly, um, John chapter 13 to 17, which we call the upper room discourse, um, this material, the teaching, precious teaching given to Jesus' close disciples only. It's a major section of the Gospel of John, and it's actually unique to John. You don't see uh, this material in other Gospels. And the second reason comes from this passage we've just read. There are two phrases in this passage. I don't know if you... Um, would have picked up on them. Two phrases that suggest this is a, a ministry-forming moment for the Apostle John. So the first is in verse 33, and the second phrase is in verse 34. In verse 33, can you see it there? It's the phrase, little children. Little children. J Judas has, has left the room, and Jesus now finally is alone with the disciples who are faithful to him, to his own his crucifixion is around the corner. It's coming. But tonight he will, he will care for his disciples. He loves them to the end. And so the first thing he says to them is, is little children. My little children. The form of this word, this word for little children, is found eight times in the New Testament. Eight times in the New Testament. It's always a term of endearment. We find it only one time in the Gospel of John. Where else do we see it? Where else do we see this phrase? Paul, yes, certainly says, my little children in the, the book to the Galatians, out of endearments, but also out of concern for the path that they were on. But that is a different form of the word. No, every single reference other than this one in the Gospel of John is found in one other place. And that's in the letter of First John. The letter of 1 John, the words, these precious words of Jesus to the disciples, John would pick up and would become the word he uses over and over again in his letter to the church. The second um, reason is that in verse 34, that phrase, new commandment, where else do we see that? Nowhere else in the New Testament except in the letters of First and 2 John. Again, as John writes to the church. So if you, if you read the, the, the letter of 1 John, you could actually summarize it in this way. It is simply a commentary on Jesus' words here in verse 34 and 35 of John chapter 13. It's an expansion of what Jesus has said. So look at verse 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The, the, the letter of 1 John really is an expansion of that. 
You cannot help get the sense that as John would write to the church, as he cares for the, the church that is dear to his heart, he has in his heart and mind the care that was given to him, the model of Jesus Christ to the disciples on this night. So this night is an important night for John. Jesus, with careful and loving teaching, will prepare their hearts for what is to come. And what is to come is his death and burial and resurrection and his ascension. And then finally sending the Holy Spirit. Jesus on this night and in the weeks to come is setting John and indeed all the disciples on a course, on a, a mission from which they will never be swayed. Not by earth's treasures or enemies' persecutions. It's an important night for John. And so Christ's words in this passage are important for us as well today. In a sense, they are so familiar, aren't they? We, we maybe have heard them so many times, and so they are dangerously commonplace for us. But oh, how I pray that God would open up our hearts so that we could reconnect with the words of Christ as He commands us to love one another, reconnect with them in a real and vital way this morning. I have three headings for us today. Number one, the glory of God's love from verses 31 to 32. Number two, the mandate to love from verses 34 and 35. And number three, the failure to love in verses 36 to 38. So let's look at number one, the glory of God's love. With Judas having left, uh, the passage opens, the final barrier essentially to the hour, the hour that Jesus has been speaking about throughout the Gospel of John, the hour of his death, the final barrier is now gone. And so he says, now is the Son of Man glorified. The hour has come. And a culminating word to describe this hour in John's Gospel, to describe the cross of Jesus Christ is the word that we see five times in these two verses. It's the word glory, glory. Look at verses 31 and 32. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Now, as we read through that quickly, it's a little bit confusing, isn't it? What, what does that actually mean? I want to just spend a little bit of time to break this up phrase by phrase. It says, now is the Son of Man glorified. The Son of Man is Jesus Christ. That's the, the title from Daniel 7 of the glory of the Messiah. And the Son of Man is now glorified, meaning the cross of Jesus Christ is the great glory of Jesus Christ. From man's perspective, the opposite is true because they, they mocked him the next day. They beat him. They spat upon him. They placed a crown of thorns on his head and beat him on the head. They scorned his kingdom saying, Hail, King of the Jews. It seems from man's perspective to be Christ's great humiliation. But as men in this time seek to make Jesus the object of humiliation and shame, at the same time, Christ is becoming the object of humiliation eternal glory and praise and the cross of Jesus Christ casts its shadow over all of history all of human history everything that has ever happened before and everything that will ever happen from now on the cross casts its shadow over that James Boyce says there's nothing that has happened in the world's history from the beginning of creation until now or will ever happen before that day when all things will be wrapped up in Christ is as significant as the crucifixion. The cross is what the host of redeemed will sing about forever and ever and ever in joy and in awe, giving glory to the Lamb who was slain, who is the lamp of heaven. One of my favorite lines from any hymn comes from the, the hymn, Jesus Paid It All. And the line goes like this. And when before the throne I stand in him complete, Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat. In other words, I'm going to be singing at the end of my life about the cross of Jesus Christ. And I'm going to be singing a million years from now about the cross of Jesus Christ. Well, then Jesus goes on to say, and God is glorified in him. 
in the Son. So the atoning work of Christ is the great glory of Christ, but it also reveals the great glory of God, of God the Father. John Calvin said this, In the cross of Christ, as in a splendid theatre, the incomparable goodness of God is set before the whole world. So indeed, all, all the attributes of God are magnified through the cross of Jesus Christ. We often use the, the example of the fact that his love, his perfect love and his perfect justice, this tension that has existed in the Bible is satisfied only at the cross. He is both completely holy and just, never turning a blind eye to sin. He will never sweep sin under a rug and it must be punished. But at the same time, he is loving and merciful, offering forgiveness and his presence to his children. He must be both loving and just, or else he is less than God. But it is only the cross of Jesus Christ that makes the, the, the love and the justice of God possible or come together. It's only the cross that, reveal, that resolves that tension. J.C. Ryle said this, The Son shows the world by his death how holy and just is the Father and how he hates sin because sin was dealt with by the Son at the cross. The Father shows the world by raising and exalting the Son to glory how He delights in the redemption for sinners which the Son has accomplished. So while there are so many ways that we could talk about the glory of God revealed through the cross of Jesus Christ, I believe it's appropriate in this passage that is talking about love to talk about how the cross reveals the glory of God's love. The glory of God's love. I love how Ryle points out that the cross reveals how God delights in our redemption, how he delights in it. We, we must never forget this. We love to champion the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ, and rightly so. The cross is about Christ's wrath-absorbing, atoning work. He died to receive the punishment against sin that should have been our punishment. It should have been ours, but we must be careful in our presentation of the gospel to accurately portray the Father's heart. See, the cross is not just about uh, a loving Jesus who steps in uh, in the way of, a, of an angry God out to get blood. That's not what the cross is about. The cross is the apex of the plan of a triune God who purposed from eternity past to redeem sinners to himself. The Father delights in it. One theologian put it this way, God isn't moved from wrath to love because of Christ's death. He's moved by love to satisfy his wrath against us by removing our guilt and enmity through the blood of his cross. He's speaking to preachers. He says, whatever else our people understand, they must see that mercy and grace are God's idea and accomplishment. See, the cross glorifies the Father in that it reveals just how much He loves His sinful children. 1 John 4 verse 10 puts it this way, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us. He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Is the Father's love precious to you? J.R. Packer um, who passed away only about a week ago, who is one of the, the great theologians of our time. He wrote one of the great, greatest works, I believe, of the last few decades, the, the book Knowing God. And he says this, If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. In other words, if you don't understand, if you don't cherish the love of God as a father towards you as his child, then you do not understand Christianity. And Jesus goes on to say, finally in this verse, And if God is glorified in him, that's in the Son, God will also glorify him, the Son, in himself, in the Father. In other words, the Father receives the cry of the Son, the, the obedient Son. It is finished. On the cross, He receives that cry with pleasure 
And he vindicates the Son through resurrection. And the Son ascends to the Father's side to receive the glory and praise of, of heaven and ultimately of all creation. It's the glory of God's love. Secondly, we see the, the mandate to love. The mandate to love in verse 34 to 35. So just as the Father is glorified in the Son, and the Son is glorified in the Father, so the, the very purpose of our redemption is that we would glorify both Father and Son together. And we glorify God by becoming like Him. Look at verse 34, 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So... I learned recently, um, maybe this is to my shame, uh, I spent most of my adult life wondering why the Thursday before Good Friday is called Maundy Thursday. You, did you know, know that? Usually in the Holy Week it's referred to as Maundy Thursday, and I didn't know what's this Monday Thursday thing about. Uh, I thought Maundy, you know, sounds like a, a sad word, like morose, maybe it has something to do with, with the garden. But actually it comes, I found out, from the Latin mandatum. Mandatum, from which we get the English mandate from this, this verse. It's taken from the, the Latin translation of the Bible, the Vulgate. And uh, in that verse, it's mandatum novum, new commandment. And that's where we get Maundy Thursday from, just as a, um, an interesting fact. But what is this, this new commandment? Jesus says that we love one another, that we love one another. So then you, you approach this passage and you must ask the question, how, Jesus, how is this a new commandment? This command is given to Israel in Levitic, Leviticus 19, 17 to 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord your God. In fact, Jesus combines that command with the command from Deuteronomy, love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And he says, this sums up the entire law. So Israel were commanded, they were given the law, and the law was summed up in loving God and loving others. So how then can Jesus say, it is a new commandment I give to you? I believe the answer is found in who is speaking this command now and what's about to happen to him, the context of it. So the new commandment given by Jesus is a new commandment because first it comes with a, a new standard. A new model. I love the, the, the great picture of grace that we see um, in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, where Isaiah is given a vision of the glory of Christ just filling the temple, the glory of the King. And his response to seeing that glory is terror. He, he says, woe is me, I am ruined, I'm, I'm lost, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I live amongst the people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the king. And in his desperation to get away, as he's cowering in, in terror, he experiences the healing touch, the, the touch of grace in the form of a burning coal upon his lips. He's shown grace, this picture of, of grace in the book of Isaiah. And his response is, here am I, send me. I'll, I'll go wherever you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. As I just had a, a foretaste of the immense grace of Christ, and Jesus therefore speaks to them in these words. He says to them, and here's where it's a new commandment. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. They have seen the King of glory. He just, he's just gone low and washed their feet. And they will see him die in their place for their ransom. So John Piper comments, he says, This degree of greatness, making this degree of sacrifice, has never before been seen. Never before been seen. And so Christ will set, he's about to set, and he has set before our eyes a sacrifice so great that really the Christian life is, is just trying to comprehend it. Living out a, a comprehension of that love. So the, the commandment is new because of the, the glorious standard set by its speaker. And so we live out our lives um, comprehending the sacrifice and living out joyful sacrifice in return. 
Secondly, the commandment is a new commandment and then it comes uh, in a new power. There's a new power behind the commandment that's given. A love for one another, therefore, is not just imitation, it's more than imitation. There's an interesting expansion upon this verse, this new commandment in 1 John 2 verses 8 to 10. As I said, 1 John is a commentary of, of these verses. 1 John 2 verse 8 to 10, John says this, At the same time it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light and in him there is no cause for stumbling. So being a disciple of Jesus does not just mean therefore copying the light, it means abiding in the light. So Piper comments again, he says this is mainly not just imitation but manifestation. We don't just imitate the love of Christ, we manifest Christ's love through our lives because we live in Jesus, in the light, and therefore our love is His love. There's a new power behind our love. So First John makes clear that the evidence that you are uh, born again, that you are a child of God, that you know God, that you are in the light and no longer in darkness. The evidence of that is your love, your love for one another. John will draw out this point in chapters 14 to 16, as we're going to see over the coming weeks. He uses language such as, or John, Jesus uses the language of being a vine and we the branches. And because we are vitally connected to him in that way, therefore we bear fruit. And he speaks of the Holy Spirit who, who comes in His name, who indwells us. And through the Holy Spirit, we live. And so as we manifest the love of Christ, we accomplish the purpose for this commandment. Look at verse 35. By, all, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. D.L. Moody said, Show me a church where there is love, and I will show you a church that has power in the community. Um, I was recently greatly encouraged by uh, the report that um, was sent out in our bulletin, the report of of our giving, the church's giving towards the, the HBC COVID lockdown relief fund and how that money has been used in conjunction and partnership with a, a small church plant in the area of Ndwedwe. And how that has led to a growth in that church, a growth in their Sunday school, as they've blessed the community with food packages, a growth in the church so that in this house church people are now having to sit outside. And a leader in that community has even donated a plot of land to the church because uh, for recognition of the role that they are playing. This is what we want to be known for. We want to be known for a love that cares for the suffering and the needs of our community. But, isn't it interesting that Jesus says, they will know that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. The way you love one another. So there there ought to be something about the church community itself that is a witness in the world. The, The church in the world today is taking more and more heat, I believe in our culture. It's true. We're taking more and more heat, but it's around our teachings. As we stand upon the Word of God, we plant our our flag in the ground and say, we stand upon His Word. This is the very Word of God. As we do that, we open up ourselves to alienation from the world that is living in rebellion to His Word. Um, That's to be expected. That's nothing that is new either, is it? Every now and then, I know in my own heart, I I read of, of how some... Um, doctrine is under fire in the world or somebody has said something in the church and and again the label is brought out that the church is hateful that we are bigoted and honestly at times I quake a little bit in my my soul I think of my my children growing up and I quake a little bit in my soul but then I I remember he said no this is to be expected they will hate you because they hated me but did you know that there is an area In the life of the church, in which the world is actually given, it seems, license to judge the church. 
It's like Jesus has given the world the right to judge the church. Francis Schaeffer points this out. He says Jesus is giving a right to the world upon his authority. He gives the world the right to judge whether you and I are born again Christians on the basis of our observable love towards all Christians. That's pretty frightening. And so if the world were to look in, to, to the, the life of HBC. If they were to look in on us, would they see the love of Christ in the way that we treat one another? Would the world see love? Just as I have loved you, Jesus says, you are to love one another. How has he loved us? John 15 verse 13, greater love has no one than this, than someone lay down his life for his friends. The early church faced derision and persecution from a watching world. They were accused of treachery, of treason, for their refusal to give honor to the marketplace gods. Their teachings were misinterpreted. They were maligned. It's no different as as it is to today. But there was something about that that early church that made the watching world stop and, and scratch its head a little bit. Tertullian, the the church father who lived towards the end of the second century, in his work Apology, he he quoted this pagan observation that he heard from time to time, where he heard the, the world saying, look at how they love one another and how they are ready to die for each other. Now, the laying down of one's life, sometimes in the life of the church, as we love one another, becomes a literal fulfillment, even in, in, in this world today. But it should always be a spiritual reality that we live and are marked by this, a laying down of our lives for one another. Now, we could apply this command to love one another in so many different ways. The New Testament has a lot of what we call these one another statements, and I could talk about those for days. Um, we would spend a lifetime just learning what, what that really means to love one another in the church. But this morning, I just want to boil it down to this one question. This one question that you should ask of yourself. If someone observed my engagement within my church community, could it be said of me that my life is marked by the self-sacrificing love of Jesus Christ, that is marked by this laying down of my life for them. If somebody looked at your life, would they say that that's true of the way that you engage with your church? John Bloom points out, he says, we we tend to look at this commandment to love one another and to think about how the church is doing as a whole. And that is a, a good exercise. We should be asking the question, how are we doing and loving one another? And loving the world. But he, but he points out we, we often stop there because when we stop there, it diverts attention away from us. And we should simply be asking this question. This is where we start. Do people know I am Jesus' disciple by the way that I love others? Do people know I'm Jesus' disciple by the way that I love? In other words, is my life marked by a heart of sacrifice, the heart of sacrifice, that even sent my Jesus to the cross. D.A. Carson says this in, in commenting on this verse, The new command is simple enough for a toddler to memorize and appreciate, profound enough that the most mature believers are repeatedly embarrassed at how poorly they comprehend it and put it into practice. So the the cross casts its shadow over history, over everything that will be and everything that will come. But do you feel the shadow of the cross over your own life? Ultimately, this is what it means to love like a Christian. We glorify him by looking like Jesus. And so our love must be grounded in and inspired by the love that Jesus has for us. And it should share, I believe, the same goal. It should have the same goal. What is the goal of Jesus Christ and his love for us? It is a love we know that sacrifices to see that others would treasure Christ the way that he is meant to be treasured. And that should be our love. We we love others because we want them to know the joy that we know of knowing him. We want them to know that same joy. Now, we 
We struggle, don't we? <laughs> and we are so often prone to failure. I know this is true of me. I don't love others the way that I should. And I don't always even love my Jesus the way that I should. And so I thank God for the story of Peter in John's Gospel. And let's look at finally in closing number three, the failure to love in verses 36 to 38. There are two words I said in John 13 verse 33 um, that shape John's life and ministry and it's the words little children. Well, Peter hasn't heard um, anything except the rest of that verse. Yet a little while Jesus says, I'm with you. You will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. Christ's words are going to become a great focus in chapter 14, and we're going to look at them next week. But these are not easy words for, for the apostles to hear. And they were not easy words for, for Peter to hear. And so he pipes up and says in verse 36 to 38, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you will follow afterward. You will follow afterward. Praise God for that grace. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, truly, I say to you, the rooster will not crow till you have denied me three times. Judas it's not the only one to betray Jesus this night. And yet, and yet, the stories of Judas and of Peter are so different, aren't they? Why was Peter's story different to Judas' story? It's because as great as his betrayal was, Christ's love was greater still over Peter's life and in Peter's heart. See, the, the greatest power to love to love God and to love others, the greatest power comes from this precious knowledge that it's actually not what I do that secures the Father's love for me. And we are called to follow with love, with a love that, that evidences a heart of self-sacrifice. But we need to understand, as Peter needed to understand, that there is one place that Jesus went to, to which we will never have to follow. He went and he walked the, the path to the cross alone. Peter says to him, Lord, why can I not follow you? I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus says, will you lay down your life for me? In other words, no, Peter, I'm going to lay down my life for you. Uh, the other night I was reading with my boys, um, my favorite Bible story that they have, the story called The Friend Who Forgives, is the story of, of Peter. And I'm, I'm reading the story with them and I'm, I'm struggling to actually get through. My voice is breaking, tears are, are filling my eyes and the boys are looking at me like, Dad's gone crazy. And it's because as I'm reading about Peter's failure, I'm all of a sudden filled with this deep awareness of my own failure to love my boys, to love my, my children, to display the love that I have for Jesus in, in the way that I, I should treat them. I want them to know how wonderful Jesus is. And I, I know that I have an important role in that. I have the role of, of setting a foundation for their view of fatherhood. I don't want them, when the time comes, for them to embrace the love of the Father, to be impeded by the failings of their earthly father. But as I'm reading and feeling the sense, this, this weight of my own failure, there's another feeling next to that, and it's a feeling that is bigger. It is a profound joy and a gratitude at the grace of Jesus Christ over my life. So with tears in, in their crazy dads, I, I can read to them the conclusion of the story. Which goes like this. Peter spent the rest of his life telling people about his best friend, Jesus. He told them that if they put their trust in Jesus, he would forgive them again and again and again. That's because Jesus was Peter's best friend. He forgave him again and again and again. 
And if you trust in Jesus, he will forgive you too, again and again and again. And I could put the book down and say to them with joy, boys, does, does daddy often mess up like, like Peter messed up? Yes. Yes, daddy's sorry that he messes up. But you know why, why daddy thinks Jesus is the best in the world? It's because Jesus, even though daddy fails again and again and again, Jesus forgives daddy again and again and again. And so we are, we are called to love the world. We're called to love one another in a way that shows the world that we belong to Jesus. But at the same time, there is power in the knowledge that, that Jesus' love for us is not dependent on what we do. And his love for us sets the foundation for our love for others. It sets the course of our lives. And for that reason, we walk in joy, in the joy of self-sacrifice. So as I, I leave you this morning, ask yourself again this question. If the world looked at my life, and the way that I engage with my church, would they say that my life is marked by the self-sacrifice? Do I love like Jesus loved me? Let's pray. Oh, dear Jesus, I'm just so grateful for the Gospel of John. I'm so grateful for the privilege that you've given to me to lead your church through this gospel. I'm so grateful for the privilege that you've given to us to feast on these words week in and week out. And so I just pray that you would fill our hearts again with your word, with an awareness of the Father's love for us. God, you are great. You are glorious. We are grateful. And I pray that you would help us to love one another. God, I, I so desire that Hillcrest Baptist Church would be a beacon in our town. A light that points to you. So God, I pray that you would whittle down our pride, our self-sufficiency. That you would build up our dependency and our love. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Thank you, church family, and thank you for um, friends who are watching in as well. Uh, we love you, and we hope you have a, a great week. So, oh, we do have a final hymn, uh, so don't go anywhere. Stick around, and, and let's sing Jesus Paid It All Together.